Hey everybody, welcome again to This Cultural Moment, a podcast about following Jesus in the post-Christian world. This is our last episode in season three, and we continue and both land the plane on this conversation around secularism as a system through systems theories, as a failing system, and more particularly on this idea of secularism as a collection of ideas and the way those ideas are used by both human tradition and by what Paul in the New Testament calls the elemental spiritual forces of the world to drive the human soul and human self away from the life that God has for us. So some really interesting things to lean into today. Think about the 20th century. You had on one side this idea of racial utopia and that ends in the Holocaust. You take the idea on the left of communism that we could create this classless society. These were ideas that were never truly tested and millions of people died. As we land this plane, we just want to continue this conversation around the role of ideas in human flourishing or the exact opposite of it. You know, Mark, there's this line that I think of through this whole conversation from Dallas Willard in The Renovation of the Heart, which if you've not read that book is, I don't know, for sure in my top 10 books of all time. And he just has some great work around the role of ideas in society and in the human soul. Let me just read, to begin, let me just read a paragraph to you from his work on this chapter is called Strongholds of Evil. And he writes this, ideas are, and images are also a primary stronghold of evil in the human self and in society. They determine how we take the things and events of ordinary life. They control the way that we live. He goes on to write, ideas and images accordingly are the primary focus of Satan's efforts to defeat God's purposes with and for humankind, which I'm just paused that. It's not how most of us think about Satan's MO and his war against God and his kingdom through this weapon of idea, but he has weaponized ideas. When we are subject, he goes on, to his chosen ideas, Satan's chosen ideas, and images, he could take a nap or a holiday. Thus, when he undertook to draw Eve away from God, and I love this, he did not hit her with a stick, but with an idea. It was with the idea that God could not be trusted and that she must act on her own to secure her own well-being. This is the basic idea back of all temptation. God is presented as depriving us by his commands of what is good So we think we must take matters into our own hands and act contrary to what he has said. This image of God leads to our pushing him out of our thoughts and putting ourselves on the throne of the universe, the condition of the ruined soul and the world naturally results. Wow. (laughs) Should we just end it now? Just start with, start and end with Dallas Willard. I mean, can I just uh, also just add my commendation, in fact, slash order that if you haven't read Renovation of the Heart, you just yeah. order it directly after this. You've stopped listening to this or while you're listening to this, you can do two things at once. Um, but that is such an important um, concept. And if, as you were just reading that, I had the image of, we talk about an idea bubble. You know, you can put an idea bubble in a cartoon yep. and it's sort of like this little cloud above someone's head and it has these little sort of mini clouds going to it. And when you think about that image, it's actually about a disconnect from someone and it's this difference between that and an action or a way. Uh, An idea that then rests in a way or an action is actually something which is put into play, put into purpose. And so ideas that haven't been tested are actually dangerous. You know, there should be a warning that goes with them. Um, You think about the 20th century, which was the history's most bloodiest century, you had on one side this idea of a kind of racial utopia from fascism, this idea that we could create a new kind of modernity through taking these violent energies and of blood and soil. And that ends in the Holocaust. That ends in millions dead on the battlefield. You take the idea on the left of communism, of utopianism, that we could create this classless society of equality and achieve a kingdom of God without the king. 
And you look at Stalin's millions dead, you look at Mao's millions dead, you look at Pol Pot's millions dead, and these were ideas that were never truly tested and millions and millions of people died. Ideas that at the time were not only socially acceptable but were in vogue amongst the elite yes. of the day. And I think even Willard says in The Divine Conspiracy that you know the killing fields of Cambodia and what Pol Pot did there lead back to conversations that were being having, had on the left bank of the Seine in Paris by intellectuals when wow. Pol Pot was a student. Because um, there's something to these ideas that were untested. Man, my mind just immediately jumps to a lot of the social and moral and sexual issues of today that are yeah. untested ideas. Yeah. I mean, even I was in the British Library a couple of months ago where Marx would read and come up with these concepts, you know. And then you see what that then leads to, you know, yeah. in, in Russia. And we forget that their end goal was to create utopia. It yes. was to create a better society. It wasn't we want to destroy everything. That's what happened. But mm. the end goal was a utopian society. Mm. And in many ways, going back to that idea of a failing system, this Western life group, bring it down from that large-scale horror of totalitarianism. Yeah, but that's easy because we can look at fascism and to a certain extent communism and say, yeah, that has those have both been exposed as untrue narratives, yes. at least in that original form. Yes. But we're not ready to say that yet about Western secularism. Yes. And so this, this, this contemporary life script that hangs over us, that unlimited freedom is going to make you happy, the question I would freedom ask... Freedom redefined as the ability to do whatever you want. Yes, yes. I mean, I would ask people, are you happy? Which is the tricky thing because every single study I've read on happiness says that it basically started to decline in the late 50s, early 60s yes. with the rise of the counterculture. Yes. And in, in America, it's American stats, I don't yeah. know about global, and has been on a steady but slow decline year over year. Every year, America drops mm. lower on the happiness index. Well, I mean, a, study, a stunning uh, thing just came out that both the UK and the US which are the two leading countries of the yep. Anglo world. Of this world. vision yeah. of the secular Western they, hyper-individualistic worldview. Life expectancy is for the last three years started to drop, Yes, which is phenomenal. And there's which a is whole one of the of first things that, that economists look at yes. for the health of a society. Yes. So there's this sense that we've been given this idea and the idea is not working. And, and you're saying the litmus test is ironically, to throw the American question back, are you happy? Yes, yes. Are, are you anxious? Anxious anxiety is, in a, is, a, is a canary in the coal mine. Are you rushed? Uh, do you feel a tightness in your chest? Do you feel satisfied? Do you feel content and at peace? Are you flourishing? Is your family flourishing? Do Are you your feel relationships? Safe? Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, the fact that we're using this language of feelings and it's interesting even the growth of the term safe place. This is a safe place. There's this sense that we, we actually say that because we don't feel safe. Weirdly, we're actually in a society that has some of the lowest rates of violence in yes. human history. Yep. And, you know, would you rather live now or during the Hundred Years' War or World War II? I'd rather live now. And But there's this sense that psychically we're not safe anymore. We're no longer in this place where we have a home. And this is where we start to then can play off this idea that what the enemy wants, and if, again, we go back to... Uh, Eve, we there's almost this sense that what's really interesting question is what's Adam doing in that exchange? Yeah, he's like, just where M -I -A. is he? he and, and in a sense, and that's, you're referring to the Garden of Eden story yes, when yeah. the serpent comes at Eve with yes. an idea, that's with a, an a deceptive idea. idea that plays to a disordered desire. With question marks on the starts end. Starts to distort her view of God, her view of what it means to be human, and her view of the good life. Yes, and I, I can't remember who said it, but it's almost as if like the snake's almost like a question mark when it stands like a cobra. <laughs> and you know, we Adam's, did not say that, but I see the cartoon in my mind. Yeah, I see the Bible yes. Project video in my mind. Yes, yes, there you go, guys. Um, Take that, Tim and John. Just yes. turn the snake into a question mark. Yes. And there's this sense that Adam is gone to the the, the first male sin is passivity. Yes. Really interesting. Before you never hear that. No. Because and, later there's the Mac and the male domination yes. that becomes the main problem. Yes. But it's not the first problem. And objectification we often talk about. But before ob objectification happens when you've stepped out of a relational matrix with someone. If I step back, so if we're talking, we're, we're in relationship now. If I stand in the corner of this room and just go, there's John Mark. Look at him. Look, there's his trousers. Objectify What's he doing? Me. I'm objectifying you. So, be so before, which then I objectify you, I then can hurt you because you're just an object. You're not a living thing like me. Yep. I, I other you, to use the language. So it begins with male passivity. 
it then begins with objectification. Then that leads to domination and violence. And then we get to Cain and Abel. It turns into murder. And Lamech and um, yep, yeah. polygamy so, and the mess yeah. that is the Old Testament. And yeah, so there's this condition. sense that Eve is isolated. We see Jesus, uh, Satan comes after Jesus when he's isolated. Now you think about Jesus' life up to that point. I mean, Jesus lived in this relationally rich environment that we struggle to understand. To live in a Jewish village at that time, you are connected to cousins. Everyone knows your name. You hear the Psalms sung at night. You go to the house of study, the Bet Midrash, where you study the scriptures together in these groups. Religious Jews still do that today. They, you'll see these amazing pictures of these houses of study where they're studying till three o'clock in the morning, and you have a partner who you study the scriptures with. It's like a tennis partner. You know, you go back and you disciple each other. So Jesus lived in this totally enriched relational, religious, formational soup. You know. But Satan comes when he is alone. Satan comes when he's in the desert. And then he puts lies into his mind. Yes. If you are the son of God, this. If you are this. So here's a question. Why does the life script lead to atomization? South Korea. What do you mean by atomization? Atomization where you just become an atom as an individual, not connected to anything. Got it. Japan and Korea. Why does the life script of the secular narrative lead you just to be this hyper individual out on your own? Define yourself, your own identity, your own, make a life. And we're seeing the stats, you know, I think we've spoken about in past podcasts that I think it's like in, in Germany, the city's now with 40, 50% people living alone. In Australia's inner cities, that's the dominant household. We're trending towards, like Scandinavia is heading towards that being the dominant household. And you notice this even when you come to Portland. You said this, and again, I live here, so I forget it, but this city is insanely young. Yes. You basically walk through the urban core of the city, and it's basically just a bunch of single Upwardly mobile, 20 and 30 something people. There's what, like, where are the families? Where's the multi generation? Where's, for all the talk about community, there's very little of it on the street. And that answers a really interesting question, which we've raised before here. You come to a city like Portland, and in the storefronts, you'll see this sign, you know, we believe in diversity, we accept anyone, different races, genders, religions, yet it's, America's widest city. Now, part of that is because of racial injustice yeah. in the in the past. In our past, yeah. but also, and I was talking to someone about this this the other day, who's not you know Asian background. She goes, "This is a city for white people because talking about Portland, Portland because." If you're Asian or you're Nigerian or whatever, you're connected to extended family. You're connected to multi-generationality. You're connected to tradition. You're connected to tradition. You've got to go and visit your uncle. And this city is about blow up the tradition, do yes. whatever you want, hang out with your friends and just do what feels good. There was an interesting study too that um, uh, Latino young women have better self-esteem because they hang around with people they're related to, other older females who are not their mothers. So to be healthy, we need to hang around with a, a plurality of relationships. And not just the nuclear family as yes. the kind of conservative American. The extended, extended family. The community sense. Of Uncles, the aunties, cousins, neighbours. So a city like Portland and large parts of Melbourne ends up trending towards this incredible atomization. And even if you're not in Portland, the world is so transient due to the new knowledge economy, the career base. People move from city to city exactly. all the time. And everybody transient is the new normal. And that's where, this is where I say, you know, if, you, if you're hearing this and saying it sounds like we're just critiquing the leftist progressive vision, I want to swing a bat here at capitalism or extreme capitalism. South Korea and Japan, which has doesn't have all of the progressive stuff going on, now has what they're like, uh, I think it's called Honjok, I can't speak Korean, I think that's the term. There's a term for what they're calling loner culture in South Korea, who has pushed way into liberal, neoliberal economics. And they have now a whole generation. There's now loner restaurants where you go and eat alone. And they're like, how do we then create a social structure of welfare to provide for people who are going to be living alone? So that's that's where you've got that neoliberal. And that's without the progressive thing. Yes, that's yes. just based on the neoliberal capitalistic yes. vision. And so we've got both. We've got the yes. neoliberal capitalist vision. We've got the progressive oh, and thing. They and they, they just create chaos together. Come together, right? yeah. Because the capitalist vision is just move, be transient, social Darwinism. Yes. But then the leftist vision is obliterate all tradition, religion, custom, culture. Yes. And and you see even just place. Like I my, my neighborhood... Um, which I've grown up in and the mall where I lived, it's just turning into this mini downtown. There's bits I don't recognize anymore and historical buildings getting knocked down with overseas investment. And so you walk to your own neighborhood, you know, I don't even feel connected here. So we don't feel connected to the land. We don't feel connected to And you're others. not transient. I'm not transient. And goodness me, what must the indigenous people of Australia feel? like? So there's this sense of the 
it, why does it trend? Now we're going, okay, yeah. go back to Colossians. I see what you're saying. So you're going from ideas to isolation. Yes. And you're saying, why does the secular Western life script, either conservative or progressive. Or a combination of both. Or, the, or and for most of us, a combination of both, trend toward this hyper-individualistic isolation. I think that's really interesting. Yes. Um, I've done a number, uh, some of you know, I've spent the last five years or so doing reading and research around spiritual formation. And very long story short, I've come to realize that it's essentially by spirit and truth that we are formed in the image of Jesus and by the opposite that we're formed in the image of the devil, which is isolate. If spirit is presence, the presence of God in our life, the opposite of that is isolation. And if yes. truth is the reality of God and his vision of human flourishing in our life, lies are unreality. So it's not just these ideas of lies or unreality, it's this isolation that is at the heart of the enemy's plan. Is that what I'm hearing you Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. That the two are tied together, ideas and isolation. The enemy is creating a truth desert for you to get lost in so he can pick you off. And there's this sense where he wants you in this place where you're trying to work it all out yourself, where you're doing Google theology, and or podcast theology. Podcast theology where you just Beware pick what those you podcasts. want. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're dangerous. And again, too, I mean, honestly, I know, I know you, both of us have mentors speaking into our life. And if you're at home and you think, oh, you know, John Mark Homer, Mark says, are dangerous without older, wiser yes. Christian people who we follow. Why? Because they're, they're committed to the authority of Jesus and they're following him. And our community, you're in town this week because there's about 15 other lead pastors that are some of our best friends that we spend a week together every yes. year. And one of the things we do is hold each other accountable, yes. not just morally, but theologically. Yes. And a bunch of us brought our staffs together for little kind of um, off the record, mini pastors conference kind of thing. And that's what you're here for. Totally. And then we have older multi-generations. I think of my mentor who's actually flying into town for this and mm. my spiritual director that you met on Sunday and mm. the elders of our church. And like we're surrounded by community in part because we know what would happen if we got off alone. I, I remember a clear moment when I was in my 20s and I just was begin to explore a bit of a theological territory that was that was problematic and I remember Al Hirsch, my my boss at the time, mentor in my life, just saying, hey, Marky. He'd always call me Marky. Marky. <laughs> I'm going to start calling you Marky. <laughs> I just, I say, that's hey, Al's. Mark, hey, Marky. Yeah, Marky. Um, and he said to me, Mark, be careful of believing what you want to believe. And I was just like. Be careful oh. of believing what you want to believe. And that's the idea that these ideas often play yes. to these desires in us that are off. Oh, that was such a gift to me at that moment. And it was just like, oh, my goodness, I could fall into a Christianity where I believe what I want to believe. Why? Because I'm a guy from Melbourne. I'm in my 20s. I'm going to end up with some Melbourneish progressive theology. And at that point, I thought, hang on, I need to go back to Scripture. I need people speaking into my life. So there's people here listening to this, who are almost on the edge. You're sort of like, I'm listening yeah. to this because maybe I'm in a church and I'm struggling to get me to. I see this to, all over oh, our church, yeah. It's like, how do I, you know, maybe to church, you're like, how do I engage with the stuff going on in culture? Maybe my church is not talking about it. And there's a whole panorama of voices out there. And you will find people who are going to, like, if you're like, hey, I'm just wondering about this, you're going to find voices on Google through podcasts that are con con going to confirm any error that you may walk into, you will find voices online who will conform your biases. Yeah. And so there's a danger we're heading towards. And I'm a Protestant. I'm a, a you know, a, I'm not Catholic, but there's a danger where we head to hyper Protestantism, where individuals in churches create constructed DIY theology Interesting. that then just confirms their, so their when, desires. When you, oh gosh, that's good. So when you say hyper Protestantism, are you, Am I hearing you right? You're saying that Protestant, like, kind of reject the authority of the Catholic Church, which at the time was sola scriptura, will stay based on the authority of scripture alone. But that kind of the way it ended up tied to Western individualism is really interesting. Yes. Hence, thousands of denominations yes. and thousands of churches and church splits, because there's this I am the authority. I decide what's right, yes. what's wrong, what's true, what's false. Is that what you mean by yes. yes. hyper-Protestantism? And, and so it's, there's this ultimate anti-authoritarianism. So there's a natural skepticism we have in the West against oppressive authoritarian figures. and that's Because our whole nation was, at least in America, was yeah. built around rejection of oppressive authority. Yes. 
and and even in Britain, Britain's history was they killed Charles the First, um, and Oliver Cromwell created a a republic, and yeah. Britain had a, a constitutional monarchy which kept in check the power in the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight of the of the king. So even so, there's this deep suspicion yes. of authority in the West. Yeah. So there's this 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 thing where power needs to be kept in check. Now that's good and rightful. We don't like you know totalitarian dictators are horrible. But there's this sense that we are so trended into anti-authoritarianism that we don't realise that that's actually our default setting. So there's this new trend which is emerging of what I call hyper-Protestantism, which is like, oh, I'm going to come to your church, John Mark, but I'm actually going to... Oh, and I, lo- I, love and I the, like it. It's great. Oh, the worship's and... great. And I love how I felt God. And I love how you push into the spirit. I love your sermons. But this bit of the Western secular sexual theology or dogma of Western culture... I like that too much. So I'm going to take parts A, B. I'm not going to take part C. Maybe part D, I'm just not sure on. And I'm just going to have my own DIY, construct your own, you know, theological uh, outfit. And that's hyper-Protestantism. Because that's how we do everything in life. Yes, yes. And so we carry that over in how we do the church. It's really interesting the way that you're tying this to isolation. I need to be careful what I say here. But I feel that some of the most unhelpful or untrue ideas coming out of the church right now are ironically from people that are still quasi-Christian but are post-church. Yes. And they it's a podcast, it's a blog, it's a book series, it's a speaking tour, but nine times out of ten, it's people that are no longer rooted in a church. I wonder if there's a connection there. Not that there isn't bad theology coming out of, ch- coming out of churches. There most definitely is. Yes. But I wonder if there's a connection to what happens when people drift away from both church and the sense of community around you and yes. church in the sense of orthodoxy, what yes. followers of Jesus have said. I mean, I think about the, sexu- the redefinition of sexuality. You are li- to, to take that progressive vision, you are standing against 2,000 years of a nearly unequivocal voice across gender, across race, across class, in Africa and Europe and South America and Asia. This is what followers of Jesus have said for 2,000 years. And you say, no, that's oh, wrong. And, and every other culture, Islam, um, you know, the, the Dalai Lama, all, all of that African tradition, all of it, you're like, nah, sorry, guys, I've, I've sorted this. Like, I am smarter than all of you. I'm smarter than all you people outside the West. And so there's this sense that what has happened is because also there's this confusion at the moment that you can have platform and you can have platform without authority in a spiritual sense. That's the other confusing thing. So there's this... But the way the internet has shaped that. The way the internet has shaped is, and, and you can be either celebrity pastor who there's not a lot of spiritual authority there, but you've just got a large followership, or you can be the sort of post-church deconstructive Christian blogger who's not in a, in a church, um, but you've got a large following. And... Ultimately, what Jesus builds a different kind of... Or, so I'll go back one step. We're used to the idea of positional power versus spiritual authority, that you can have someone who's not the king. Jesus has incredible spiritual authority, but very little earthly power. Yeah, he's, he's not the governor of exactly. Israel or whatever. His, his, his interactions with the Sanhedrin and with Pontius Pilate, he, he comes off having the power because he's got spiritual authority when they had earthly positional power. So we get that. There'll be someone who could be manager, but then there's the person who's got a different kind of power. But now what we have is spiritual authority versus platform. Wow. So it's not so much I'm the manager, I'm the boss, I'm the governor, I'm the lead pastor. It's I have this many followers on whatever. It's a platform. It's fame. It's internet access. And sometimes those things come together and God uses technology and we're doing it now. We we are doing it. anti that. But the minute I lose my spiritual authority, seriously, come after me and I'm not allowed to do this podcast anymore. Yeah. And you're saying a lot of that is tied to life in community because community yes. will actually vet whether or not your life and your message are true to the way of Jesus or yes. not. Yes. We were chatting about that even, you know, Sunday where our church is right downtown and we have a number of houseless people that are with us regularly on a Sunday. And during one of our gatherings, you know, right before you got up to teach Mark, I'm up giving an announcement and there was a lady there who was not in her right mind mm. who disrupted the gathering and began yelling back at me and such. Mm. And we were just chatting about how different that would have been if it was a Twitter conversation. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Where there wasn't the clear sense of community to yes. make sense of the voice and the situation. Mm. And maybe that's a touchy example. But on the Internet, you can't discern that in the same way that you can when you're in the same room with people that you know. 
Well, another way to put it is people will honk and have road rage against other people because there's the protective bubble of their car, but then they bump onto someone in the street and like, hey, so oh, sorry, I'm man. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> bumping happens in the relational context. Yes. So ideas disconnected, ideas in our current idea economy can be even more disconnected, but you cannot build a life around ideas. You build a life around a way and you cannot, everyone was going to fall for some authority. Willard's thing is you're following someone. So this is an, this is an, a, we're all disciples of somebody all disciples or something. Of we wanted to say that we made up our own life script. We did not. And, and what the Western life script has said is, oh, you can actually, you can live a non-authoritarian life and not be anyone's disciples. The reality is you're a disciple of the shareholders of Silicon Valley tech companies who have set the exact rhythm of your life. Wow. You know, I, I, it's true. And if you're listening and you say, why do you beat up so much on the, the progressive side of things rather than the conservative side? And back to what we said, and I think episode one of this season, like we are in progressive cities. We're not trying to do everything. If you want to hear a great critique of the right, listen to Russell Moore or somebody like that. But we're in Melbourne and Portland, and we're in this kind of ideological colonization moment of the progressive vision. And I think, you know, for me, Mark, when I travel, and sometimes I'll be in a city that is still has remnants of a cultural Christianity or a more conservatism, or I think I was just in San Diego, which is this weird mashup of it was originally a military base, but now it's still that. So there's this conservative cultural Christianity there, but then there's also the Portland South Park, hedonistic, secular, new age. So it's just a weird mashup of a city. But whenever, whenever I'm in a city or a place where there still is this hangover of conservatism or Christianity, I sense this like romanticism that people have around the progressive vision. Yes. And I'm in a progressive city and I'm telling you the romanticism is not founded in reality. This to me does – I walk the streets of this. I live in the city. I'm raising three kids in the city. I'm swimming in the ideology of this city, the temptation of it, the allure of it, the ridiculousness of it. And I'm telling you this does not look and feel like what Jesus called the life that is truly life. And, and it's important too that, you know, as we said, I think in the first one of this series that we're not trying to do just an American podcast. I'm, we're here in America, yes. you're an American, um, but this is really about the West. And for me, the conservatism that I see, particularly into, intertwined with some parts of evangelicalism, is so bizarre to me. It, it, I don't understand it. Um, so conservatism in Australia looks different. Conservatism in Britain looks different. And so there's this element that these things look different in different places. So that's a really key differentiation to me. Yeah. Again, thank you for just exposing my American <laughs> American centricity or whatever. Um, but I think it's an important point because also what's happening is you're even seeing people in – one thing I've noticed recently is people in Australia commenting against American conservatism because, again, too, because of the hegemonic power of American media – they're seeing things, you know, they're more invested in that than even our local politics now, yeah. which is a fascinating dynamic. But I think returning to this, yeah, this, this to key yeah. thought that if you're listening and this is your only spiritual food, see this as an invitation back to root yourself in a community of faith where people are following Jesus. And don't put over that a perfectionism that you would not put over yourself. Churches are not perfect. My church is not perfect. I love your church, but I, I know it's not perfect. Yeah. But that's where we find ourselves in imperfect people following a perfect savior. And that's, I think, really, I guess we're kind of getting our pastor hats on yes. right now. You know, we don't want to devolve too much into the advice category, but that's really our heart for those of you listening that you, and really, it's our heart for us yes. that we would stay true to Jesus and his way and his truth and his life. You know, again, Eugene Peterson died yesterday by our time. It'll be a few weeks by the time this comes out or a few months even. And I just love his line on the Gospel of John. It's the way of truth, the way of Jesus wedded to the truth of Jesus that brings about the life of Jesus. And so the call for us is just to stay faithful to Jesus' way, to Jesus' truth, his mental maps of reality that we navigate the world by and as we live into that to experience the life that he has for us what he later called in the gospel of john the life that is truly life so that's our heart for you we think that's jesus heart for all of us and thanks so much for your time and i know wherever you're at at the gym or your morning commute or 
on the bus in whatever city, whatever continent, whatever nation you call home. We're grateful for your time. We're grateful for your ear. May God give you wisdom. May he give you discernment to know reality from unreality. May he lead you and guide you into community out of isolation. And may you experience the life that he has for you. Grace and peace. Thank you.